Well, good morning, New Life Church. My name is Robbie Anderstrom, and part of my story is growing up here at the New Life Church and Academy. And so I thought it'd be fun to bring some pictures with. A senior pastor has to kind of reserve their stories as they preach throughout a year. But as a guest speaker, I can kind of take a little more liberty. So here's a picture of me and my buddies, Josh Putnam, Carl Limblad, Mike Hanna. You know some of those families. You'll notice the time stamp down here. It was in 2003, so quite a few years ago. I was 12 years old at this time. Here's a picture where I went on my first mission trip. This is at the front doors of New Life Church. I looked pretty excited to go on that trip. And uh, uh, a story dear to my heart would be that mission trip was the first time that I experienced God's love in, in an overwhelming way. And I remember one night uh, kneeling down in a parking lot at a church and I just remember, remember feeling overwhelmed by God's love. And I wrote in my Bible after that experience that God is the fullness of life. And I've remembered that to this day. Oh, another story about this time of my life. About a year or two later, our family ended up moving to Woodbury. My dad resigned from his corporate job and took a position here as an associate pastor. And so... I have memories of the New Life family coming out to our house to help us move. I remember one family came at 10 o'clock one night because they heard we were behind schedule and needed help. I remember my mom pulling me off to the side the next day and she said, you know what, last night, Robbie, she said, we had a vice president of a Fortune 500 company cleaning my kitchen floors and vacuuming my rugs. And it was a demonstration of love that our family still remembers. Here's a picture of me in the academy. Uh, I'm not sure quite what grade this was, but I have fond memories of the New Life Church giving me rides to school. I lived a block away, and so many of you would roll down the window and ask if I wanted a ride, and I usually took you up on it. We usually had some good conversations on the way there and back. Oftentimes, you might have made the difference between me being tardy or not. Another story from here would be my senior year of high school. This is a tough story. I had a concussion. Uh, I was three plays into my senior year of football as quarterback. And apparently guys can still tackle you whether or not you see them. And those are the ones that hurt the most. And so that uh, is a, a tough story in my life. Uh, it followed up a couple years later in college. I had a concussion that turned into a traumatic brain injury. I had to drop out of school for two years and move home. And so that was a story I would not have chosen, but God has delivered me from that and healed me up. About college time in my life, back in 2009, I would have been a freshman in college, New Life sent out a bunch of families from church here to go plant a church in the west side of St. Paul. Uh, it's called Twin Cities Church, and here's a bunch of the families that you guys commissioned out. I was part of that, and the church here even financially helped support um, this effort in the early years um, to, to get going, and that church is over 10 years old now and doing really, really well. I was there for about seven years until I had an opportunity to come back here as a pastoral intern. It involved helping with the youth group here. Had a lot of fun with that, a couple opportunities to preach, um, and one of the opportunities I had to preach uh, was very unexpected. I, I probably wouldn't have chosen that opportunity. Uh, I heard about the opportunity to preach on a Saturday afternoon. I was at a bachelor's party. I was getting married. I had just come back from my bachelor's party of camping with my brothers up in Taylor's Falls, and we came back, and we stopped at my parents' house to deliver the tent. And my parents sat us down, and I knew right away that something was a little off. And my father explained that he had stage four cancer, and just found out. And that the next day, he was scheduled to preach a sermon he had prepared. And he said, Rob, would you deliver my sermon for me? And what God had placed in my heart, I said, you bet, you bet I will. And so I delivered that sermon the next day for him. And 
that started the journey of wondering what was going to happen to my dad. Uh, many of you know him. He was a pastor here for probably a, 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 a 10 years or so. Uh, moved, transitioned into working with missions work. Um, and he got pretty sick. Um, we, we weren't quite sure what was going to happen. Um, this is him in, a, in the hospital. This is him. Uh, I think we brought him maybe some chocolates. He always liked that. And he was in and out of that bed for a while. And, and you know what? We cried out to the Lord in this story. And God heard us. And, and he answered. And he, he saved my father. And he's healthy now. And this is out at their farm place that they moved a couple years ago in Roberts, Wisconsin. They got a beautiful view there. And um, just cherish the time that we have together. So those are some of my stories. Uh, let's talk about some of your stories and our stories. We all have them. Life is a whole trilogy of sequels of stories. They just keep coming in one after another, don't they? And God is weaving through our stories a story of redemption. And some of those stories are really tough. I, I hear through the grapevine the kind of stories happening in the lives of people here at New Life. And when I was preparing the sermon a couple weeks ago, I heard reports of some new cancer diagnosis here at New Life. And it breaks my heart. I wish that the sting of sin and death would be over. I wish that you didn't have to experience the pain that you do. That there'd be no more tears and no more sorrow. And yet these are part of our stories. So I want you to think for a moment a story in your life. There's something going on. Either uh, you're at the beginning of something or in the middle or at the end. But think about a story in your life right now. and Hold that in your mind. And I, I care about that. Your pastors here care about that, but most of all, God cares about that story. And so we're going to look to see what he has to say to us about that today. So we're headed over to Psalm 107. But before we get there, most psalms have a location in Scripture. And so the, the location of this psalm is believed to be Ezra chapter 3. And so in Ezra chapter 3 we see a little glimpse of Israel's story. Most of the Bible is following the thread of Israel's story. And in their darkest moment, they have a point in their story where you wonder if they're down for the count. You wonder if the character of the story is going to be able to get back up again. And against all odds, they do. Or rather, God does. And Ezra leads the people out of captivity and they come back after a period of exile of around 70 years, just as it was prophesied, and they laid the foundation of the temple, and they had a big party. They had a huge gathering, and they celebrated. And the refrain of what they sang during the celebration is that, for he is good, and his steadfast love endures forever. And you're going to see that refrain today during Psalm 107. The refrain that says, for he is good, and his steadfast love endures forever. And so we get to our psalm here. And the psalm starts off in the introduction. It starts with that refrain. It says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. And it says, Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. This is a fancy way to say, If you have been redeemed, tell your story. Whom he has redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. So if we piece this together, he talks about how God has gathered them in from the lands. So this is a gathering in which they're telling their stories of how they've been redeemed. Sounds pretty fun, huh? You guys on July 26 are going to have an opportunity to gather again due to the coronavirus quarantine, you're coming back. A lot of you will. And when you get back, what do you do at gatherings, right? After a church service, what do you usually do or a family gathering? You, 
you go talk to someone you know or don't know yet, and you say, what, what are your current stories, right? How's life? What's going on? And you tell stories. And that's what they're doing in this situation, right? In this introduction, they've gathered together, and they're going to tell stories of how they've come back to the land. So we're going to look at four stories today, and they're going to be great. They're going to be written in poetry. We don't deal with a lot of poetry these days, but the poetry of the day was kind of the, the Netflix, you might say, of the current day, uh, the way of doing movies. It, it was meant to get something beyond just head knowledge and into your heart. It's meant to grip your imagination and really sink in. And each of these stories has a classic storyline of three parts. Oversimplified, there's a beginning and a middle and an end of each story. And so in each of these stories, you'll see those three parts. In the beginning, you'll see that they're caught up into something. There's an inciting incident. They're, they didn't necessarily choose where they're at, and they're caught up into the action. And then in the middle, that action reaches a boiling point, a tension that finally breaks into a pinnacle moment that makes all the difference, and then it resolves, and you see the resolution of how things played out. So, our stories are a desert, a dungeon, a deathbed, and the depths of the sea. And these are pretty grim situations to be found in. I try to think to myself, what would be worse than those situations? Maybe inside a volcano, it could have been a fifth one. Um, but uh, God certainly could have redeemed from that situation. But these are the four that were, stuck, were given. And so in the first one in the desert, it says this. In the, in, the, in the beginning of the story, it says, Some wandered in desert wastes, finding no way to a city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted within them. Then in the moment that made all the difference, they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way till they reached a city to dwell in. In resolution, it says, let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. For he satisfies the longing soul, and the hungry soul he fills with good things. It's a pretty good story. We get to the second one. It talks about these people at the gathering of Ezra. And some of them had sat in darkness and in the shadow of death. They were prisoners in affliction and in irons, but they had rebelled against the words of God and spurned the counsel of the Most High. So he bowed their hearts down with hard labor. They fell down with none to help. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. That was the moment that made all the difference in the middle there. And then it says, he brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death and burst their bonds apart. And in resolution says, let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. For he shatters the doors of bronze and cuts in two the bars of iron. We have another beginning. This is the story of the deathbed. It says, Some were fools through their sinful ways, and because of their iniquities suffered affliction. They loathed any kind of food. They drew near to the gates of death. And in the moment that made all the difference, then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He sent out his word, and he healed them. He delivered them from their destruction. And in resolution, it says, let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man, and let them offer sacrifices of thanksgiving and tell of his deeds in songs of joy. And our final song is the depths of the sea. The beginning, they find themselves, it says, some went down to the sea in ships doing business on the great waters. They saw the deeds of the Lord, his wondrous works in the depths, for he commanded and raised up the stormy wind which lifted up the waves of the sea. They mounted up to heaven, and they went down to the depths. Their courage melted away in their evil plight. They reeled and staggered like drunken men and were at their wit's end. Then in the moment that made all the difference, and they cried to the Lord in their their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He made the storm be still, and the waves of the sea were hushed. Then they were glad the waters were quiet. And he brought them to their desired haven. In resolution it says, let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. Let them extol him in the congregation of the the assembly and praise him in the assembly of the elders. In other words, let them tell their story. 
So as the psalm continues, the verses share about how God has the authority to turn any situation on its head. From good to bad, bad to good, ultimate authority is his. And in the concluding verse of this psalm, it says this. It says, those who are wise will take all this to heart. Not just the head, but to the heart. They will see in our history the faithful love of the Lord. This is the New Living Translation. The ESV, it, it follows that same phrase about instead of the faithful love of the Lord, the steadfast love of the Lord. So what did this mean to the original audience? It would have meant everything. Everything. These people had been gone away from their land for over 70 years. And Ezra chapter 3 says that at this gathering, there's some of the older men that remembered the temple from 70 years ago. And so when they saw the foundation laid again, And all the people gathered together again. It said that they wept loudly. And for others, they were just so happy to be back, right? They made their way out of the desert, out of the dungeon, out of the deathbed, out of the depths of the sea. And they were pumped. And so they were rejoicing. And Ezra chapter 3, it says that they were so loud that you couldn't distinguish whether it was mourning or rejoicing, and it said that it could be heard far, far away. So this was a big deal for them. You know, last week, Pastor Brett wrapped up the series in 1 Peter, and there's a verse there that talks about how God himself will restore them. That was written many, many years after this, but the concept of being restored, boy, did Israel want that. Where they, they were waiting for that. They were scattered from their land. Their nation had been burnt to the ground. They couldn't gather at their places of worship. Can you imagine what that would feel like? Kind of you do if you're watching this online. You probably haven't been in this building for a while. You know, a quarter of the Bible deals with the prophets as they are crying out and pouring their heart out to God, asking him to restore Israel. The the Jewish tradition, I found out, they remember this time of exile. They remember the time of mourning that they had. And they do so every July. In the United States, we are celebrating here the 4th of July weekend. And yet, for the Jewish tradition... Starting this Wednesday at sundown, they, they have a, um, a holiday that they call, it's translated as the three weeks of dire straits. And that first day, they start with a fast. And the last day, they start with a fast. Because they record the month of July as the month that the first temple was torn down. And they record the month of July as the month that the second temple in 70 AD, just as Jesus predicted, was torn down. You know, in the scriptures, there's even a book called Lamentations. And in Lamentations chapter 2, it says that Israel's wound was deeper than the sea, and that they were to pour their hearts out like water before him. A couple of weeks ago, you guys sang a song called I Will Lift My Hands. And the lyrics in there say, be still, there is a healer. His love, kind of like in, the, in Lamentations 2, it says that their wound was deeper than the sea. Here it says that his love is deeper than the sea. And then it, the song goes on to say, as I pour up my heart, these things I remember. You are a faithful God forever. Similar to what Lamentations says, to pour your heart out like water before him. God, just as he promised through the prophets and even through Moses in the law, according to 2 Chronicles 7.14, when Israel humbled themselves and prayed and sought his face, God heard from heaven and he forgave their sins and he healed their land and he brought them back. He restored them. 
or in the words of Psalm 107, when they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, God delivered them from their distress. So before we jump to what this means in our time, what do you think this meant in the time of Jesus? I had fun thinking about this. Because when Jesus walked to the earth, he walked in a Jewish context. And the people around him were familiar with their Bibles. They were familiar with the story of Israel. They were familiar with this psalm as they would sing it in their synagogues, right? This was a big event in the nation of Israel to have been redeemed from exile. And it strikes me how the imagery of Old Testament deliverance is imprinted across Jesus' entire life. And so, as I put myself in the situation of perhaps the disciples, and I think about these four stories and the imagery and how catchy stories are and poetry, I wonder, you know, in the first story about the desert, what they wondered when Jesus fasted for 40 days and 40 nights and sustained himself in the desert. And I wonder what they thought when he went to the wilderness and in the desert and Jesus was feeding the 5,000. I wonder what they would have thought about that. Or maybe like the second story about the dungeon and the imagery of that. I wonder what they would have thought when Jesus grabbed this scroll on, on one Sabbath in the synagogue and read, I have come to proclaim freedom for the prisoners. I wonder what Peter would have thought post-resurrection when the jails of his, de- his this, <laughs> excuse me, the gates of his jail cell swung wide open. Or like the third story, I wonder about the deathbed. What people would have thought about that imagery of Old Testament deliverance as they saw Jesus healing the sick or raising Lazarus from the dead. Or my favorite would be that fourth story in the depths of the sea. I wonder what the disciples thought when they saw Jesus walking on the water. Or especially when he calmed the sea before their very eyes. Some of these words almost verbatim from the psalm about making the waters be still and quiet. And the disciples' reaction when that happened was they were struck with a great fear and they were astonished and they wondered, who is this who has authority over the winds and the waves? And I think it should pop, make us pause and wonder, who, who is this? So, Finally, what does this mean for us? We are in a different context. We're not the nation of Israel. We weren't specifically the people in these four stories. We were not promised that after 70 years we would be headed back to build a temple in Jerusalem. But God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And so there's some things we can learn about God from this. First of all, God cares about ordinary distress. These are not stories about David and Goliath or the parting of the Red Sea. These are stories about someone who is homeless in a desert running out of food and God saved them. These are stories about people stuck in jail and God delivered them. These are stories about people that were on their deathbed and they weren't quite sure they were going to make it and God saved them. These are stories about people who are in a sinking ship and God saved them. They found their way into the Bible because God cares about ordinary distress. I think about when I had my concussion and my brain injury. And it was a scary time because I wasn't quite sure I was getting any better. And it made all the difference to me. I remember one day thinking to myself, you know what, this is really hard, God. And thinking to myself, I know you care. And I just imagined Jesus weeping with me. Just like he did for Lazarus when he heard Mary weeping for Lazarus Lazarus who'd been laid in a tomb. Jesus wept. And he cares. (laughs) Secondly, God responds when we call to him. They could have taken out the part of the psalm where they cried out to the Lord. God could have just done those same things. And yet I think it shows that God is a responsive God and he wants to hear your voice. I think about when my father was in the hospital bed. And I remember him telling me, he said, you know what, 
I've done a lot of hospital visits over the years as a pastor, but when you're the one laying in the bed, it's a totally different thing. It's totally different when it's your story. And when you're in the story, remember, God responds when we call to him. We cry out. And we did that. We cried out for my dad. I remember a conference call where there was about 40 people, most from New Life, on a conference call, pouring their hearts out to pray for God. I remember babysitting for my nephew, Wilson, and every night he prayed, God, heal Grandpa. His grandkids were praying every day. And I wonder if in divine providence, Dad's work in missions got him contacts to the point where people all over the world were reported praying for him. A third thing that we can see from this is that God is able to save. God is able to save. To look at these verses, I'll repeat some of them to you, some phrases. So in verse 7, and I'm going to speak this right to you. He can lead you by a straight way till you have reached a city to dwell in. Verse 9 in the story of the desert says, For he can satisfy your longing soul, and your hungry soul he can fill with good things. The story of the dungeon, verse 14, He can bring you out of darkness and the shadow of death and burst your bonds apart. Verse 16, For he can shatter the doors of bronze and cut into the bars of iron. Stories of the deathbed, verse 20, He can send out his word and heal you and deliver you from your destruction. The story of the depths of the sea, in verse 29 through 30, for he can make your storm still. He can hush your waves. He can quiet your waters. And he can bring you to a safe haven. His arm is not too short to save. And point four here, God is gathering us to himself in the grand story. Through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, he is gathering us to himself, to our eternal home. You know, the gospel according to 1 Peter says, Thanks be to God that in his great mercy he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance now that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you. In the grand story of all of humanity, God is gathering us together. Not necessarily like the nation of Israel for a one-time celebration, but for a celebration that's going to last for eternity. And for all eternity, we're going to be able to see how our stories have been woven together to point to God's redemption. So what part of a story are you in right now? Maybe you're at the beginning of a story. Maybe something just happened. Maybe you just got an email today, or you just got a text today, or maybe your water heater just broke today, (laughs) and you're just taking it in. You're saying, whoa, okay. (laughs) I didn't get to choose that like I chose my story on Netflix, right? That one just happened to me. This is now real, okay? If you're in that first part, take heart. Know that you're not alone, right? Right? The scripture from 1 Peter Brett showed us last week about after you've suffered a little while, God will restore you. That promise is true. We don't know the timing of it. But then move here to the middle of the story. You don't have to stay there. Move to the middle of the story in the moment that makes all the difference and cry out to the Lord in your trouble. Cry out to him. And you might say to me, Robbie, <laughs> this is kind of simple, okay? Like I, I know that I'm supposed to do that. I know that you ask God for help and he helps you. It sounds pretty simple. But let's just kind of dig into that for a moment, okay? The story you're thinking of right now and that you started at the beginning of the sermon here thinking about, have you cried out to the Lord for that? Sometimes there's things in our lives, there's stories in our lives, and we haven't. We haven't prayed about it. And maybe you'd say, well, that story wasn't that big of a deal. I didn't need to pray about that one. I, I, could, have handled, I could handle that on my own. And I just imagine these people in the story is saying, you know what, God, <laughs> I'd really like to cry out to you, but I really need a paddle because in case you haven't noticed, our ship is sinking, <laughs> right? You're not too busy to pray. 
You're not too busy to cry out to the Lord in every story that you find yourself in. Perhaps you're in the middle of the story and you're crying out to him in that way. Remember that it's all over scripture. It's in Romans, it's in the book of Joel, it's in Acts. It says, everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. And Maybe you're at the end of a story. Maybe you're just coming out of one. Maybe you're in the resolution where you're seeing how it plays out. Then thank God, just like the psalm says, thank God and tell your story, all right? Share it to the people that you know. When they say, hey, how's it going? Share your story. You know, an objection you might make to this last part is, well, what if I don't like the way that my story was resolved? What if I don't like how it ended? What if I didn't get at, what what if I didn't get what I asked for from God? That's a very real objection, right? What do you do then? Next week, Matt Swigert is going to be here, and he's going to share out of Habakkuk what faith looks like when it's hard. When Habakkuk was told that he was going into exile, and he wasn't going to make it out, God has a lot to say about that. But I can say that God's redemption is coming, right? Right? He's making all things right. Jesus' victory is already, but but not yet in every way. We're waiting for that consummation in heaven where there'll be no more tears, no more sadness. I think about, I mentioned earlier a little bit about Peter, the guy who wrote 1 Peter that you just got done learning about. There's a story in Acts where his jail cell swings wide open and he's let out. And he goes to a house and he knocks and people are praying for him and they don't believe it's really him and they need to keep praying because they don't believe it's him. And finally he gets in and he says, hey guys, I'm back. Let everybody know. He says, let James and the brothers know. And earlier in that verse, and I think it's referring to a different James, uh, but it definitely makes you think about it. Early in that verse, when Peter was put in jail, James was put in jail and killed. Two disciples of Jesus, and they had two different stories that day, didn't they? Yet God is sovereign over all, and he is redeeming our stories. He is weaving them together. I think about in the Old Testament, so during the exile, right? And some of the Jews are told to bow before a golden statue, and they say no. They're going to be thrown into a fiery furnace. And they say, you know what, King Nebuchadnezzar, they say, Our God is able to save, but if not, we will still not follow you, right? That is a mature faith right there. So as you think about your stories, wherever you're at, however they're landing, remember that God is weaving them together, a story of redemption. And as verse 43 says in this psalm, those who are wise will take this to heart. They will see in our history in our stories, the faithful love of the Lord, the steadfast love of the Lord. So this 4th of July, as we celebrate freedom in this country, remember the story that you've been freed from sin and death and that Jesus Christ is returning to make all things right. And as you think about that story, make sure when people ask you for your story, you tell them pray with me Heavenly Father I thank you that we can cry to you in our trouble and that you will deliver us in our distress and I thank you for that final ultimate victory through Jesus Christ that you are making all things right and I pray for anyone who's watching this that has not yet surrendered their life to Jesus Christ and cried out to you taking that first step of obedience to make you Lord in their life I pray for that person right now that they would humble their spirit and their hearts and that they would turn their story over to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, amen. Well, thanks for sharing a Sunday with me.
I wish you the best. My heart goes out to all of your stories. And I'm excited to see how God weaves the story of redemption. So blessings this week.